Bibles to Proverbs chapter 9, and this is the verse that we're using in this series on the fear of God. <clears throat> I have never heard in my life that I can recall a sermon on the fear of God till I preached my first sermon about five, about five or six weeks ago, maybe two months ago. Uh, I have never preached on the subject until about two months ago. Um, up to this point, I've preached five sermons, and I plan to preach about four or five more as the Holy Spirit directs. They've been such a blessing to my life to study the Scripture and to realize here's an area that no doubt all gospel preachers have brought in one way or another, but most have never really honed in on such a meaty and helpful doctrine as the doctrine of the fear of God. And I think that's one reason that there's so much chaos and heartache and brokenness in the society of America today is because most Americans, including, I think, most Christians, have not the fear of God in their hearts. And I'll elaborate on that in just a little bit. But our text, and we're using it every, uh, every Sunday evening while we're in this series, is chapter 9 of Proverbs and verse 10. And let's stand together and read it uh, aloud. Uh, verse 10a. All right, let's read. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Let's do it again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> the first message in this series, uh, I dealt with the fear of God as it relates to the character of God. And we've tried to use Scripture, and almost all of our illustrations have been right out of the Scripture either quotating, uh, quotations of verses or of stories in the Bible that illustrate these truths. Now, when we can imagine being in the presence of an outstanding world leader and the sense of, uh, of dignity and reverence that we would have, but when we consider the character of God, his nature, and his uh, power, we recognize that the Scripture uh, indicates by virtue of who he is that he deserves to be feared. Now, there are a lot of other words in the English language that could have been chosen if fear is not the correct word that God wanted us to use in the English language. But fear is a word that is chosen in the translating of the Hebrew and the Greek into the English language. In fact, God is referred to in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, he is called the fear of Isaac. God is called fear, the fear of Isaac. Then the second message, we dealt with the word of God as the fear of God. And even though I memorized this passage in Psalm 19, it wasn't until I began to study the scripture that I realized these six designations for the Bible the commandments of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the law of the Lord, and lo and behold, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And there in that line of six uh, designations for the Bible, it is called the fear of God. That's amazing, isn't it? So that was one message. The next message dealt with an ungodly fear of God. The scripture teaches us that there is an ungodly fear of God. And a person who wants to do right needs to recognize that and needs to avoid an ungodly fear of God. And then the next sermon we dealt with, well, what is godly fear? Because most of us have never heard a sermon on it, even though we read the Bible, we've never really given a whole lot of thought to it. And I'm sure in this congregation that we've had on Sunday nights, uh, we've had some people to raise their eyebrows and to second guess what the pastor was saying and to really question the validity of even talking about things like this. Nobody, well, most people have not confronted me directly. One person in a kindly way did, but I hope the person's eyes have been opened. Uh, uh, what is godly fear? The scripture tells very clearly what it is, and we dealt with that. Um, then the origins of godly fear. Um, we dealt with that last week and pointed out that it comes from the love of God for his chosen people. 
and it comes from a new heart. A person has to have a new heart in order to be able to experience this godly fear. It comes from a, a, a reverence of the Word of God and from the kind of faith that God wants us to have, and repentance produces this kind of godly fear. Yeah, it, it, it originates uh, as we consider God's judgments and remember former distresses from which he delivered us, and as we consider the answered prayer and the omniscience of God and the impartial justice of God and a sense of God's love and kindness to us, all of these things are origins of the fear of God that we are able to experience. And now tonight I want us to look at some results of godly fear. What happens in the lives of individuals, and we've dealt with some of these as we've gone along, but we want to hone in and try to be more specific and not to be uh, completely comprehensive in doing it because it's such a vast subject. But pointing these out and quoting scriptures, and I just ask you to think clearly with me tonight, and if we practice the fear of God as we ought, then what's going to happen in our lives? Well, first of all, there is a tremendously godly reverence for God himself. I cannot imagine people saying, uh, Oh, God, this. And a, a young girl, she's in uh, high school, and she hits a fingernail, Oh, God. Or a young person that says something funny, Oh, God, and God. And I've heard professing Christian young people just say, just as a byword. And some of the movies that appeal to young people, they use Jesus Christ like this. And just very brazen. But this is a testimony to the fact that people that do this do not have the fear of God. And if they are indeed saved at all, they are in a very backslidden condition to do things like that uh, because it shows a lack of reverence for God. Now, there are other ways that that lack of reverence can be shown. And uh, the violation of the sanctity of the name of God can be displayed in many ways, but this is one of the most common ways. And... How many times have you heard uh, any people, uh, any of you commentators like Dan Rather or anyone else say, you know, you people shouldn't be doing things like that. <laughs> I don't think you're going to hear them say anything like that. In fact, most preachers avoid any confrontation if they're on television because it might cut down on their offerings and they have to pay a lot of money for that television time. So they may look like they're fire eaters and fighting the devil and all that, but I'm going to tell you they are masters in rubbing their contributors the right way and they're not going to be confrontational to those that they're depending upon uh, keeping the TV uh, time flowing David said he is great and greatly to be feared in the assembly of his saints again David said behold as the eyes of servants look into the hands of their masters and the eyes of the maiden into the hands of her mistress so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until he have mercy on us. Joseph, one of the godliest men in the Bible and one of the strongest men and most gifted men who has ever walked on this earth, said this, I fear God. That more than any other consideration, Joseph said, I stand in awe of him. He is my dread, as it were. He is my fear. I do all of my actions in his presence and in his sight. I reverence his holy and glorious majesty, doing all things as with fear and trembling before him. And then next, there is a very great reverence for his word. David said, Princes persecute me without a cause, but my heart standeth in awe of thy word. In other words, in spite of all the problems that he had, he feared more the word of God than even the princes, his enemies that were fighting against him. It shows you something of the reverence that he had for the word of God. Then again, uh, the results of this godly fear causes us to have a, a, a tenderness and an affection towards God's glory. We can be hurt inwardly when we see the name of God and the glory of God dragged down in shame. Jeremiah said, Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appertain. 
In other words, he said it disturbed him uh, because of the dishonor that was brought to God by the body of Jews among whom he served because they brought shame to his name and to his word and to his ways. He speaks of it as a hearty wish that they would do otherwise than that, you see, because it hurt him. He had an affection towards the glory of God which originated from uh, and resulted from the fear of God. Who would not fear thee, O Lord, says the revelator, and glorify thy name, clearly concluding that godly fear produces a great tenderness towards the glory of God. Uh, David said, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. It follows then that where people do not have this fear of God, they're not going to have a tenderness for the Bible and a tenderness for the church and a tenderness for you people, the people of God. But where people have the fear of God, they're going to be very sensitive about the word of God and the way it's handled and the things of God, the church and the people of God, the leaders of the church, the Sunday school teachers, the members of the body of Christ. We're going to have a tenderness there as a result directly of our fear of God. The Bible says that Eli died with fear and the ark of God had been taken. See, his affection for the glory of God had been offended. Daniel ran the danger of the lion's mouth for the tender love that he had for the word and the worship of God, and he refused to be deterred because of threatening from his enemies. The three Hebrew children ran the hazard of the burning fiery furnace rather than they would dishonor the way of worship of their God and only uh, their God. Now next, uh, the results of this godly fear is that it produces a watchfulness in our lives. If we fear God as we ought, we're going to be very cognizant of the fact that there is evil lurking on the outside from the devil. And there's the potential of evil on the inside of our own hearts. And if we fear God as we ought, we're going to do like Jesus said, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so a result of this godly fear causes us to be on guard and to be watchful lest we uh, fall into shame. And as James said, catch the fire of hell defiling the whole body. And it makes them to watch their ways and to look well to their goings and to walk the straight path, path and to watch their mouths as, with a bit and a bridle so as not to offend with their tongue and so forth. Then again, uh, the results of this godly fear it produces edifying conversation and fellowship, the kind that builds people up in the Lord. Listen to the scripture. They that feared the Lord spake often one with another. Now, what did they talk about? When you read the context in the Scripture, you find out they were talking about the Lord and they were encouraging one another in the Lord. It wasn't that they just got together and talked about the ball games and talked about fishing and all that. That's, so, that's good. But they comforted each other by talking to one another, ministering one another in the things of the Lord because they feared God, you see. That's one of the results. Malachi 3.16, a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and thought upon his name. Now, all fear, whether it's good or bad, uh, has a, a tendency to incline the heart to contemplate upon the object of that fear. And, um, and so it is with godly fear. Whether it's good or bad, we have a tendency to focus on that. And so if we have a godly fear, then our focus is going to be on God and we will concentrate uh, uh, in that kind of a fellowship and a mode with God's eye upon us. Then again, it results in a great reverence in the use and enjoyment of his holy ordinances. That is, all of his commands and his laws and his ways. When we realize how majestic and merciful God has been and given us a Bible that tells us how to live, and how to be successful, and how to avoid calamity, and, and how to make something out of our lives. Man, it just causes us to say, thank you, God, and to be in awe of him. In the book of Acts, it said, the churches had rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified. That means they were built up in the Lord, you see. 
They grew in the Lord, walking in the fear of the Lord. That's New Testament, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. And in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. You better be careful about these people that say, Oh, God is such a God of love, you're not supposed to fear Him. They may mean well, but they are diabolically wrong with the Scripture. Now, this walking means, of course, walking in all the commandments and the ways of the Lord. Um, David said, In thy fear will I worship. God expects us to serve Him with fear and trembling, and it is repugnant among men for a man to handle himself lightly even among human dignitaries. And how much uh, more a repugnant it is when we fail to have the kind of fear of God that help us, helps us to walk reverently in his presence day by day. And then again, uh, there flows from this godly fear self-denial. That is, the, the abstaining from things that are either wrong in themselves or that are not wrong, but that God would have us not to do because he has something else for us to do. And so <clears throat> Nehemiah experienced this and said, The former governors that had been before me were chargeable unto the people and had taken of them bread and wine besides forty shekels of silver. silver. Yea, even their servants bear rule over the people, but so did not I because of the fear of God. Now, what these other princes and rulers were doing wasn't necessarily bad in itself. It was typical among princes and rulers. But because of the fear of God, the godly man Nehemiah denied himself and became more godlike in his relationship to the people. Self-denial. Paul uh, said this, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. L listen, let me tell you this. The Christian who justifies what other Christians, brothers in the Lord, sisters in the Lord, believe is evil, does not have the fear of God in his heart like he ought. Because if we have the proper fear of God, we will deny ourselves what causes our brother or sister in Christ to stumble. Self-denial is one of the direct results of this fear of God. Men that have not this fear cannot deny themselves and will justify their doings. Will go to great lengths to involve other Christians in doing what they're doing rather than practice self-denial because they have not the fear of God in their hearts as they ought to have. And so, really, this fear of God is such an excellent thing because it produces a kind of a fruit that is such a blessing to God and to other people. It's such an excellent fruit. And in fact, Jesus said that if people have not this fruit in their lives, they're not any of his. He says, um, uh, if you do not uh, hate your father and your mother and even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. That's self-denial, folks, that he's talking about there. And it's a result of the fear of God. And then next, the result of the fear of God in your life is that you set your affections on things above with a singleness of heart. Colossians 3, 2, set your, affections, set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. A singleness of heart is, can be thought of as a simplicity or a sincerity where you focus on what God wants you to do rather than how, what, of what result will it have. I, God may want me to do this, but I don't think it's going to have the kind of result that I would like, so I won't do it. That person hasn't got the fear of God. Or I would like to do such and such, but my friends don't want to do it. Or I won't get any glory. Or the last time I did it, I didn't get recognized for it. And they don't appreciate me. So there is a duplicity. There is double-mindedness. The fear of God hones in on a singleness of heart. And even though we need to be affirmed, we need to be appreciated, we all have that. We'll get it one way, one way or another. It, that's the right way. But we don't have to have it as a condition if we have the singleness of heart and an affection for the things of God that we ought to have. Uh, how dif difficult it is to serve God with a singleness of heart. Um, the, the Bible says about the children of Israel, Ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even though seventy years did ye all fast to me, even to me. 
What a wonderful thing. God is saying. And when you did eat and when you did drink, did you not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Uh-oh. They had duplicity, you see. So the prophet Zechariah wasn't complimenting them. He was telling them they went through the motions of service, but they had double-mindedness. They had not singleness of heart because they had not the fear of God in their heart. And uh, he, he goes on to say that. Now, uh, the reason the grace of the fear of God retains and keeps upon the heart a reverence and a sense of awe and a due consideration of the day of accounting that we shall have with him makes his servant sweet and pleasing and strengthens the soul against discouragement. That's singleness of heart. It keeps you keeping on, keeping on, keeping on and not putting limits and making conditions and so forth because... You don't have any baggage that you're trying to carry along with you, you see. And a lot of people, if you're serving the Lord and if you've been saving him, serving him faithfully, I can assure you you have a lot of people that somewhere along the line quit liking you and are angry with you about something and you can't even remember it because you've been just going on serving the Lord. If you thought about it, if there's any way you could rectify it, you'd do it. But if you have singleness of heart, you don't have time to keep a ledger. And to keep a record in all of these things, you leave that to God when you have singleness of heart. Jesus' uh, strongest words of condemnation were to some of the finest people of his day, some of the cleanest people of his day, people who believed every word of the Bible. They were the Pharisees. But they had double-mindedness. They wanted to serve God, but they wanted human applause. They wanted to serve God, but they wanted to do it their way, so to speak. And Jesus came down very hard on them because they, they shut their hearts out. Then next, this fear of God causes us to have a great compassion for our brothers and sisters in the Lord. The story is told in the Old Testament about a uh, Obadiah, who was a servant of King Ahab, one of the most wicked kings that lived in that day. And Jezebel, you know about Jezebel, such a wicked queen. And she was slaughtering the, the prophets who had the fear of God. And anybody that had the fear of God, Jezebel was after. And she was successful in putting to death many of God's prophets and people who had the fear of the Lord. But the Bible says about Obadiah, he took an hundred of the Lord's prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water in the days when Jezebel, that tyrant, sought their lives to destroy them. Well, why did he do it? He was blessed with the grace of the fear of the Lord. The text says he feared the Lord greatly. Because he feared God, he was not afraid, even though he was working for the husband of this Tyrant, tyrannical ruler, Queen Jezebel. Isn't that amazing? But he had compassion and pity. His heart went out to his brothers in the Lord. Why? Why was he concerned about them? Why did he want to help them? Because he feared God, you see. Now, I'm sure he had enough sense to know his life was in jeopardy, and if Queen had found out about what he was doing, he, might, he would have been killed too. But his fear of God and gave him compassion that overruled his fear of man. And it always works in that, that way. Then next, as a result of the fear of God, uh, we have a hearty and fervent, constant prayer life. One of the most astounding things in the entire Bible that I've ever come across is that Jesus, God the Son, feared God the Father. I never would have dreamed that if I hadn't come across it thoughtfully along this line. And in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7, it's talking about Jesus' prayer life and says he was heard in that he feared. Well, that's the human, the human Jesus fearing the, the heavenly Father. It is said of our Lord Jesus Christ himself that he was heard in that he feared. 
So you see, godly fear is absolutely essential to the right kind of a prayer life. And the right kind of a prayer life is essential to the right kind of godly fear. And the two go together like love and marriage ought to go together. It doesn't do that a whole lot nowadays, but you know, it ought to. And a horse and a carriage ought to go together. Isn't that the way the song goes? So uh, prayer and fear support each other if they are both the right kind. Then again, as a result, it causes us to have a willingness to give up what God wants. Uh, if God taps you on the shoulder and says, I want, I want you to donate your sewing machine, or if he says, taps you on the shoulder and say, hey, I want your son to go as a missionary, or if he taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, I'd like your shotgun, I'd like you to give up your shotgun, or maybe your fishing pole. I remember one time I, I felt like the Lord wanted me to give up my boat. And listen, when I felt he wanted me to, I brought that boat home. I had it down at Empire in a garage when I was fishing down there at that time. I brought it home, cleaned the thing up, painted that thing up. I was thrilled. I loved fish. Y'all know that. Y'all know I loved fish. But I felt God wanted me to sell my boat. So I gave it up to him. You know, the most amazing thing happened. He gave it back to me. I couldn't sell it. I couldn't hardly give the boat away. I was trying. But I gave it up to the Lord. And you know, I discovered in the scripture there's a story that's similar. And that's the story of Abraham. Where God came to him and said, I want you to give me your son as a sacrifice. And the Bible says immediately he went up and started doing exactly what God commanded and we think about, why did he do this? The scripture talks about the faith that Abraham had. And certainly he loved God. Uh, and that's the, his, his devoted love for God was the reason he did that. But when you read the scripture, you find this amazing thing. An angel from heaven came out and said this as to why he did it. And the angel called out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad. Neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou, what? Fearest God. Seeing thou hast not withheld thine son, thine only son. So one of the results of the kind of fear of God is if, God, if you have something precious that you cherish, if God calls for it, you're willing to give it to him. Isn't that wonderful? And as is the case, you can't outgive God, can you? But when you fear him enough to believe the scripture is true, then you're willing to open your hand. That, I love this story about the guy that went to see some missionaries off. And he went to the boat and he had two $20 bills in his pocket. Let's, let's say $200 bills. That sounds a lot better. $20 bills. I don't know what he had in his pocket. I, I didn't know the fellow. I've heard the story. I'm sure something like this has happened many times. He took the hundred dollar bill out, gave it to the missionary, left one in his pocket, wished him off, wished him well. When he got back home, he reached in his pocket, and lo and behold, he couldn't find the other hundred dollar bill. And he said, you know, the hundred dollar bill I gave these missionaries, I'll never lose that, but the one I kept for myself, it's already gone. And you know, serving God is a whole lot like that. If we have an open hand toward God, the Bible says a liberal soul shall be made fat. If you want to get fat, just start giving away. Give away everything. Now God's talking about spiritual fatness, spiritual plenty, spiritual abundance, you see. And, uh, and so, as a result of the fear of God, we are willing to open up to God and to give to God when He touches those sensitive areas of our lives. Let me recap these. I'm not going to... I'm not going to finish my message tonight, but I think y'all are about through. So <laughs> let, me, um, let me just share with you just and recap the ones that we've done and now some results of godly fear. And that is number one. See if you can recall. You just help me the ones I've mentioned tonight. What are some of the results of godly fear? If you can remember, tell me. I've got them written down here, but you tell me if you're anybody. Okay, a godly reverence. A godly reverence of God. Name another one. Any spiritual blessing? Which one? Okay. You're letting go. Letting go 
when God touches something with the assurance that God's going to provide your needs. All right? These things are hard to recall, but let reverence, uh, reverence for God's Word and affection for God's glory and the things of God. Watchfulness. Fear of God produces watchfulness. Edifying conversation and fellowship among the saints. Fear of God produces uh, great reverence in the use of God's commandments as we live day by day. It's all right for us to joke about Michael's verse, and, you know, but we realize we're, we're on holy ground and we're not going to trivialize the Word of God. It produces self-denial. It produces singleness of heart. It produces a great prayer life. As a result, it produces compassion for our brothers and sisters. All of these we've shown you right out of the Bible, especially those in distress. And then um, singleness of heart. And we'll deal with the others. And may God bless us. And let's say our verse together as we conclude tonight. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now remember, it's not the end of wisdom. It's not called the end of wisdom. We have to grow in the fear of the Lord. There's a way that you grow in the fear of the Lord after you become a Christian, you see. But uh, thank God it is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, we never know how God is dealing with people's hearts, but I love having an invitation. And if you need the Lord as your Savior, or if you need some other spiritual counsel or blessing, and I'll be here to pray with you and to counsel with you. And let's stand and sing our hymn of invitation. Hymn 198.